Hello and welcome. I'm uh, just going to give it a few minutes for all of our attendees to roll in to the webinar as we've quite a few people signed up today. So I just beg your patience while we, we all get logged in. Okay, well, we're up to 56 participants. So I think we'll start and then we'll probably still have some more people come as, as we begin. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. My name is Deanna Whitty Walker and I'm the executive director of Saffold Historical Museum. On behalf of the board of trustees, we're um, so pleased that you could join us during this windy, snowy day for today's lecture looking back on 130 years of Long Island golf by Phil Carlucci. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to make a plug for South Hold Historical Museum. Prior to the pandemic, the museum had hosted an in-person lecture series in collaboration with Peconic Landing. But last winter, we decided not to embark on a virtual lecture series as we all seem to be zoomed out but now that virtual events have integrated themselves into our everyday life and we're offering at the museum a mixture of both in-person and virtual events, we decided to host the winter lecture series once again. Today's the first of our lecture um, through fun and games. We'll be hosting another in early March about baseball in the North Fork and one in late March with the Railroad Museum of Long Island about toy and model railroads. Please check our website and social media for more information regarding these lectures and our other programs. We're pleased to be able to offer this lecture today at no charge. So should you wish to make a donation to the museum, please check out our website also. Um, just a little housekeeping. Uh, for the talk today, you'll be muted. So you don't have to worry if a dog begins barking in the background or if the doorbell rings. But we do want to encourage questions. So we ask that you use the chat feature that's built into Zoom. Um, perhaps you want to just take a few seconds now to see where the chat feature is located on your screen as on all of our devices, they're, they're in different places. We will allow plenty of time at the end for questions. Also, just because there's a blizzard going on, um, should Phil lose power or internet while he's presenting, we'll give it a few minutes to see if it comes back on. Um, if not, we'll try to reschedule and we'll be in touch with a date uh, to finish it up. Okay, well, a little background about Phil Carlucci, our speaker today. Phil is the author of the 2015 book, Long Island Golf, published by Arcadia Publishing. With experience as a golf columnist and feature writer, he also created the popular Golf on Long Island website in 2008 and was accepted as member of the Met Golf Writers Association uh, just last year in 2021. A Long Islander himself uh, since the age of three, Phil is an avid golfer and has played um, every public golf course on Long Island except Shelter Island and Sag Harbor. Phil has graciously donated his time to share his knowledge and enthusiasm with us. I note that his book, Long Island Golf, is available for sale in our museum gift shop in Southland. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome Phil Carlucci. Phil? Well, thank you, Deanna, and uh, thank you uh, to everybody at the museum for um, inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to speak about uh, 
Long Island golf history. It's something that I enjoy uh, researching and talking about. And I always enjoy um, meeting people who are equally interested in, in our local history. Um, I also want to thank everybody for uh, making the very easy decision to stay inside and stay warm and hop on Zoom and uh, listen to uh, a little bit of golf history. So thank you to everybody. Um, just as Deanna said, I've uh, been writing about local golf since 2008. And, and since my uh, book, uh, you know, let me just put that up. Uh, since my book uh, came out in 2015, I've done uh, a couple of these uh, discussions at uh, libraries, museums, historical societies. Uh, so it's something that I enjoy doing. And generally, generally what I do is I um, give a little uh, more of a broad overview of Long Island golf history, how golf developed over the 130 years or so. Obviously, with so many uh, historic clubs and courses on the island, you could very easily uh, spend an entire lecture just talking about any single golf club or course, especially ones with interesting backstories or prestigious origins. You, you can spend an entire season talking about uh, individual clubs. Um, but obviously, you uh, can't really do that. Today, we've got to talk about the 130 uh, private clubs and public courses that exist on the island uh, today. So usually what I do is I kind of look at it from a more broader perspective, looking at the the waves of course building and how we got from uh, Shinnecock Hills in 1891 to uh, where we are today with courses uh, spread out all across uh, uh, every corner of the island. So, and also what I do is, you know, Given the fact that this is a South Hold event, even though we're not all sitting in the museum, I try to tailor uh, some of the examples that I give um, to the region. So I'll focus a little bit on some uh, North Fork uh, clubs and courses. Uh, and I also like to give equal uh, coverage to not only public and private courses, but um, the forgotten courses that came and went uh, in short order a long time ago. And, sort of bring up that uh, uh, lost history a little bit as well. Uh, so like I said, um, the story really begins at uh, Shinnecock Hills in 1891. Um, this is uh, some very early uh, photography of the course and the clubhouse that uh, the famous clubhouse that still stands. Um, the story with Shinnecock goes that uh, a couple of uh, vacationing uh, men from the Hamptons were in Europe. Uh, they got a uh, sampling of golf, uh, European golf, while they, were, while they were there, and they were smitten with it and came back to the island with um, the intention of uh, building a golf course uh, for themselves. Uh, Shinnecock would be not the first uh, golf course in uh, America, but it was the first incorporated golf club uh, in America. And within a couple of years, it would be one of the uh, five founding members of the United States Golf Association. Uh, within only a couple of years of its uh, existence, it would host the uh, second US Open in 1896, and uh, given the time period, the much more prestigious amateur championship uh, in the same year, which at that time in the 1890s, amateur sports was much more highly regarded than professional sports. Uh, so the amateur sort of outshone uh, outshined the um, US Open, which is hard to fathom now. Um, but golf at this time, if you're on Long Island in 1895, 1896, when that US Open was played, you really would have uh, encountered sort of a hodgepodge of golf courses. Um, you had wealthy families and landowners who were having courses built for them um, for their own personal leisure and the use of their friends and associates. Um, you had courses built um, near train stations, uh, used uh, almost as a way to lure people from the city out onto the train and out to Long Island where they could play golf at a, you know, a little nine hole course somewhere that might or might not have even existed. Um, 
but you also had on Long Island, you had a number of hotels, especially on the, uh, along the water on the South shore and, uh, out on the forks. Um, and these hotels would, um, basically build golf courses to offer as an amenity for their guests, the same way they would offer uh, swimming or tennis or polo or whatever. Um, now they were offering golf on what were most likely very rudimentary golf courses. Um, this is the uh, Massapequa Hotel, which uh, existed briefly around the turn of the uh, century. And that hotel um, eventually would build a nine hole course associated with it. The course ironically would outlast the hotel by a couple of decades. Um, and something like this was, uh, I guess the common site on golf courses of that era, very big and elegant dresses and formal attire. Um, not really much to the course. Uh, this is as good as a photo as I've ever been able to find from Essabiqua. Um, but the story was largely the same at places like, and against it had the Seaview House Hotel with a this snippet of uh, news from the New York Times mentions the uh, golf course and the hotel. Uh, on Shelter Island, there was the uh, Manhansett House Hotel, which actually is also on the cover of the book. Um, this photo is a little later in the development of the course, but the quote is uh, from the course opening around the time it opened, talking about uh, the sport using requiring an attendant to carry a bag of sticks at an estimated cost of 10 cents uh, per boy. And like I mentioned uh, previously, a lot of times uh, the courses were, were used to promote um, a particular area. Uh, in this case, a pamphlet uh, published by the Long Island Railroad uh, in 1909. And this pamphlet was used to promote golf, but also to promote um, using the train to get to the golf courses. So it mentions here uh, that Shelter Island Hotel, as well as the Shelter Island Country Club, which was built in uh, 1901. Um, and as you can see in the pamphlet, uh, it talks about a express train to uh, Greenport and then a ferry to Shelter Island, or if you had the means, a direct steamboat ride to Shelter Island, which uh, I'm curious to know how long that would have taken. But um, in addition, you also had existing clubs that were already on Long Island prior to Shinnecock. Um, they would hop on the golf bandwagon as well. Um, places like Maidstone already, um, uh, had already been uh, in existence as more of a tennis club. In Nassau County, you had Meadowbrook, uh, which was a, more of a polo club, you had the Rockaway Hunt Club. Uh, you also had sailing and yachting clubs around the island that would eventually add golf courses to uh, offer to their membership. Um, but for the most part, golf in this era around the turn of the century was crude, like I said, rudimentary in nature. In a lot of cases, nothing more than some basic teeing areas, maybe a simple putting green, not really much more in between that we would uh, – uh, recognized today. Uh, there really was not much of an understanding at this time for uh, modern uh, golf principles. Like, uh, actually, this is, uh, I meant to skip ahead. This is uh, another one of these photos. This is from Maidstone. Um, again, the elegant formal dresses and putting around on the lawn. Uh, so it's all very, um, there was not much to the golf at this during this time. And a lot of these courses, especially the ones that might have been built along a, a train line or near a train station to serve a, a local community, uh, pretty much came and went, a lot of them in, uh, in short order, some in as uh, quickly as five or 10 years. Um, they might have been just simply abandoned or they were repurposed for some other uh, leisure activity. Uh, but many others went, lived on. Uh, eventually they were pretty much all modified to some degree, uh, especially when the real golf boom began. And it really took about 20 years or so before we start to see on Long Island um, and really around the country, uh, the, the more modern strategically 
designed golf courses that we would recognize uh, now. Uh, and this came, and this really came through um, the work of uh, designers and golf course architects that we look back on now and regard as uh, some of the most uh, famous and influential designers of, uh, of golf history. Uh, C.B. McDonald is uh, probably considered uh, first and foremost uh, the most famous uh, course uh, designer. He was a prominent uh, amateur golfer who would who had played in Europe. Um, he would later study European golf, um, and he made it his mission to. Uh, sorry, and he had made it his mission to. Um, build what he considered um, the perfect golf course on, and not only did he want to do that um, just in general, but he wanted to do that on Long Island. Um, he viewed American golf at the time, like I said before, as a very crude representation of what the sport really was uh, in, in Scotland and uh, elsewhere in Europe. Uh, so he wanted to build uh, what he considered basically a golf course that would incorporate all of the greatest features of European golf courses, um, you know, the hazards that we know now, the uh, different features, uh, holes being uh, laid out in relation to each other. There was a, a method to the, to the madness, so to speak. Um, and he wanted to do that here on Long Island. And he accomplished that when he built um, the National Golf Links in Southampton, which is right next door to Shinnecock Hills, literally right next door. And he built and he did that with um, help from a couple of uh, others who would uh, also go down as some of the greatest designers in local and, and international uh, national golf history. Uh, one of them was Devereaux Emmett, another prominent amateur player who um, worked with McDonald at the National and struck out on his own, uh, built some of the uh, or designed some of the great public and private courses that we still have today on Long Island, uh, not to mention elsewhere in the country. And Seth Rayner, who was a, actually had no golf uh, design experience until he was hired by McDonald to work at uh, the national course. And McDonald was so taken by him that uh, he convinced Rayner to uh, sort of work with him, made him his protege, and Rayner would eventually uh, go out on his own successful design career. And Rayner was tired. He was from Long Island uh, originally, uh, worked out of Southampton, and then would be hired to uh, revamp or completely rebuild uh, some of those prior courses that had been built in that early 1890s turn of the century period. So he rebuilt course uh, golf courses for the clubs in Bellport and West Hampton uh, he would build the famous uh, Fisher's Island uh, golf course, uh, which is regarded as one of the greatest golf courses in the world. So the wheels are really in motion at this time, uh, you know, in the middle 1910s, you know, despite World War I, which was a setback, obviously. Um, the wheels really are in motion for this new era of modern European-inspired American golf. You have these incredibly talented designers transforming uh, Long Island golf courses. And then obviously when we get into the uh, Roaring Twenties, um, this is the period of tremendous prosperity and, and wealth and uh, the, the thirst for uh, social and recreational and entertainment outlets is at, you know, a fever pitch. And so there's almost this insatiable demand for golf courses, um, you know, in addition to everything else that was in demand at this time. So if you look across Queens and Nassau County, especially the North Shore of Nassau County, there are new clubs being built. Uh, some of the most prestigious, famous golf clubs um, that still exist today are taking root in this decade of, of just tremendous growth. Um, places like Montauk, which is uh, at the time is really just kind of a barren, sandy outpost remote at the end of Long Island um, is, uh, is being developed to be the uh, Miami beach of the North 
it was called because it was going to be this uh, summer alternative. Instead of going to Florida in the heat, you were going to come to Montauk and play golf and go sailing and play tennis and stay at the Montauk Manor and play golf at the Montauk Downs. Um, in, in essence, there was basically a land, a land rush for golf course building. And I mean, these advertisements that I put up are one of uh, many uh, ads that you would find in golf publications of the time, basically giving land away for properties suitable for golf clubs, 150, 130 acres, an ideal spot for a golf course. Devereaux Emmett, who I mentioned before, is openly advertising his firm in uh, uh, publications like Golf Illustrated. And, um, and then what the one I find most interesting is 288 acres at East Hempstead available for a golf course. And what, I, what it's interesting about it is that it's openly uh, promoting its, uh, the fact that it's right in the vicinity of three clubs that already exist. You would think that that would be uh, a disadvantage to promoting land for golf course. But in this uh, era, it was actually a selling point to build a golf course, a new course, right up against literally three other established ones. And you can actually see that um, land here. This is the Nassau hub, as we call it today. We associate it with um, the shopping malls and parking lots and Hofstra and Nassau Coliseum. <clears throat> but at the time it was literally, this is from uh, the 30s. This is, it's literally airfields and golf courses. Um, at the bottom right is what today is Eisenhower Park. That was called Salisbury at the time. It had up to five courses. Uh, in the middle, right next to it, is uh, the Meadowbrook Club. Uh, on the left, south of Mitchell Field, is um, a course called Cold Stream. And in the distance, you can't really see it, but in the distance is the Roosevelt Field airstrip, and right, right next to it was, literally next to it, was another golf course. So that ad was promoting yet another uh, course right in this exact area. So this boom period continues pretty much through the end of the 20s and even goes a little bit beyond the market crash and into the early 30s. But obviously nobody could really foresee what was looming ahead when all these courses were being built. So a lot of the newer courses and clubs that emerged late in the 20s, even into the early 30s, and the smaller clubs that might have been keeping um, uh, some smaller membership or might have been serving a smaller community or area, um, a lot of them, uh, if they survived through the, through the depression, it, usually the middle, as you got into the war years, it was pretty much the end of the line for a lot of those clubs. Um, the, the depression obviously sent every club into financial distress, especially when you're dealing with uh, people, the members who are involved in finance and business. Um, the depression obviously took its toll. And then when the war began, for obvious reasons, rationing, just diversion of attention to other more important things, diverting resources, a lot of the clubs were left um, abandoned, neglected. Some were even used to grow uh, vegetables for the war effort and things like that. Um, and in addition to the pressure from finances and real estate development, uh, a lot of clubs uh, really failed to make it out of uh, the mid forties, the late forties. So if you bring it back to the, uh, North fork and look at a couple of the successes and the failures from that period, uh, one of them, one of the successes is right down the road from Southold in Kutchog is the, uh, North fork country club. Uh, North fork was originally built in, uh, 1912. And it's unique in that it's really the only Long Island golf course attributed to or partially attributed to Donald Ross. Donald Ross is another famous designer, um, similar to um, who I mentioned before, C.B. McDonald, Emmett and Rayner. Donald Ross is another uh, highly regarded American designer, um, course designer who but most of his work was done in the Carolinas and Florida, other parts of the country. He's known mostly for Pinehurst 
uh, still today. Uh, North Fork in Cutchard was actually his only, uh, his sole design on Long Island, which is almost hard to believe when you account for the number of courses here and the hundreds of courses that he designed around the country. His original nine holes at North Fork still exist in, in some fashion. They've been modified over time and worked into the 18 hole layout that exists there now. Um, but his work can still be seen on Long Island. To me, it's much more interesting to look at the courses that are forgotten. Um, there are two courses in the, uh, in the area that came about during this 20s boom that were unable to withstand that financial distress and pretty much had that arc that I was talking about before where they struggled to make it into the 40s and then uh, petered out from there. One of them, as I put up this postcard earlier, this is the, uh, the former clubhouse of the Riverhead Country Club. Uh, what, I, what I do on my site, one thing that I do is I have a series that I call the um, street name series. And what I found during my research is that if you uh, or in a community or you see streets or roads that are named with golf terminology, uh, chances are that neighbor, that street was built on the grounds of a uh, former golf course. Um, so if you're on Route 25 and River, uh, heading east from downtown Riverhead, you're going to come across a street called um, Fairway Avenue. And right after that is the Riverhead Elks Lodge. And that Elks Lodge was originally built in 1921 as the clubhouse of the Riverhead Country Club. Um, the course was built, uh, originally it was nine holes. Uh, it was expanded quickly to 18. Uh, it was on a small property. So it most likely was what we would know now as an executive length course, uh, slightly shorter than a typical um, par 71 or par 72 golf course. And if you go back and you look at news accounts from these early years, uh, they typically have these very, very flowery, grandiose uh, ways of describing these clubs. So in Riverhead's case, it was, quote, declared by some experts to be one of the handsomest and best on Long Island, it was formally opened by social functions more brilliant than anything ever before held in this town. Um, whether that's true, uh, I would guess it's probably in a bit of an exaggeration. But Riverhead did um, exist as a pretty popular social uh, facility for several years um, before it was hit by the depression. Um, there were accounts in the 30s and by 1940 that the course had been neglected for some time. Um, most likely the clubhouse and the club functions were uh, uh, had been stopped for a period as well. But there was efforts to resurrect the course open it up for public play. Um, there was sporadic use of it in the early 40s, uh, but eventually it was sold first to the American Legion and then um, eventually to the Elks Lodge. Uh, and it remains today as the Riverhead Elks Lodge uh, there on Route 25. And uh, another example was right in Southhold, um, the Raiden Club, similar trajectory to Riverhead and the other clubs that I mentioned. It opened in this one in 1924, um, originally nine holes with plans to um, expand to 18. And again, it was, um, you know, it opened up with the intention of offering tennis and bathing and, and golf and all sorts of other recreational activities to um, its small membership. And again, the news accounts of the day refer to Raiden as a new gem in the galaxy of such institutions that make Long Island known all over the world. Uh, that was written um, upon its opening in 1924, and then a later account in 1932, profiling Raiden and pretty much all the courses on Long Island in their in the Brooklyn Times Union's Raiden profile. They refer to breaking par as the equivalent of taking Bobby Jones out and giving him a trouncing every morning before breakfast including holiday Sundays. Now, again, I'm sure that's a bit of an exaggeration um, and quite the comparison, but um, in either event, like the other clubs that struggled during the depression, the club itself disbanded uh, before we even reached 1940. Um, but there was uh, some maintenance to the course through the forties. It was opened for a small fee to the public. Um, 
and by the late 40s it had been um, closed and eventually developed into what exists now in that part of Southhold uh, residences and whatnot. And really the only uh, exception to this rule um, in this, uh, this bust period of the depression and the war years is Bethpage. Um, Bethpage uh, is really one of the few, uh, well, it's, it's the only example of a course being built and flourishing during the depression. Um, a large part of that is because it was uh, driven to creation by Robert Moses behind, you know, at the helm. And obviously he was able to get uh, plenty of plenty uh, accomplished in, in building uh, not just parks, but roads. And we all know Robert Moses and his accomplishments, but A.W. Tillinghast, another famous designer was involved. So that lent some uh, prestige to the project. And um, the park turned out to be a tremendous success, not just the golf course that originally existed, but the park facilities and it was so successful that they built more golf courses, eventually leading to the red, the blue, and then the black in 1935 and 36. So by the, by the time 1936 arrived, Beth Page went from a private estate in the 20s and became a state park with four golf courses and plans, uh, and then eventually a fifth, uh, you know, later in the 50s. But like I said earlier, the, the mid to late forties was pretty much the end of the road for a lot of these clubs. And, um, what this die off did was it not only shaped, um, the Long Island golf landscape that we know now, but it also shaped, um, the neighborhoods and communities that we know today. Um, because like I said, in a lot of cases, the property that was used for those golf courses was used to then, uh, develop the neighborhoods and the schools, uh, and other public facilities, libraries, all kinds of, uh, all the things that we know now, many of them uh, are rooted in uh, the grounds of old golf courses. So if you're on Long Island in the 50s, if you're on Long Island uh, in the 50s, it's a time of um, rapid change. Uh, there are you might be living in a, a, a newly built Cape or a split in a newly laid out neighborhood. Um, there's a shop, there are shopping centers going up. There are roads being paved. Um, you're probably, you might, if you're a kid at that time, you might be going to a school that was just uh, constructed and freshly painted the year before. And so now once these communities and schools are built and the roads and highways are taking everyone out East, um, suddenly Long Island needs golf courses again, especially in Suffolk County, which is growing rapidly. The population is moving even farther east than it had been uh, prior. And a big part of this resurgence in the late, starting a little bit in the late 50s, but especially when you got into the 60s, a big part of this resurgence is not just the expansion of public golf, but it's the expansion of municipal golf. If you set Bethpage aside as its own very unique entity, widely accessible public up really develops in the 60s and early 70s. As the 60s progress, Nassau and Suffolk County are beginning to make very strong efforts to expand their park systems, uh, expand the amenities that they offer to their residents. Um, and that includes taking over some old uh, early century estates that might have been falling into neglect or disrepair, and those properties are being repurposed as parks. Um, it also includes taking over underused properties along, along the South Shore or interior parts of the island and converting those to parks. Um, and not only that, but there's also a need for more private clubs. If you moved out to the island and you had an interest in joining a country club, if you didn't have the means or the social standing to join the more traditional, deeply rooted clubs on the island, you now would be looking to join a new club. And then again, a lot of these new clubs, especially in Nassau County, were built on the grounds of former estates that had been uh, sold off or had just been neglected and taken over by uh, these uh, club organizations. 
1961 and 62 alone, there are at least a dozen golf clubs, uh, sorry, golf courses built, some public, some private. Uh, one of those built during the stretch is right nearby in Greenport at the uh, Island's End Golf Course. Uh, Island's End was built in 1961. Originally, it was a nine-hole course, be expanded to 18 a couple years later. And the centerpiece of Island's End was and still remains this par three hole. It was originally the seventh. Now today, it's the 16th. Um, this hole is uh, on a bluff overlooking Long Island Sound. You get a view on that hole that's comparable to any view anywhere on the island, public course, private club, waterfront park. Uh, this has been pretty much as good as it gets. Um, this is as it looked around the time it was built. And this is as it looks recently with my friend Rob uh, teeing off. But you can see the view. I mean, if you didn't know where you were, you might think you, you could be anywhere. You could be in California. You can be in Hawaii even maybe, you know, you just see Long Island Sound and it's really as scenic of a spot as you can get to on a golf course here. And I certainly recommend it for anyone in the area to um, go out there and see it. Um, so Island's End is among this initial cluster of new golf courses that are made available in the early 60s. And a few years later, really within the span of about five seasons, Nass both Nassau and Suffolk quickly um, expand their offerings, uh, their municipal golf course offerings to their residents. Nassau County opens four brand new nine hole golf courses pretty much from about 1966, uh, basically from the mid 60s into the early 70s they offer four new nine hole courses to complement what they already were offering at um, eisenhower park where they had at that time three 18 hole courses uh, and in suffolk county they did the same within the same general time frame they opened four 18 hole courses for their residents um, uh, west sayville timber point bergen point and then the last to open in 1972 was um, Indian Island in Riverhead. Indian Island has a bit of a unique backstory. It was originally a um, massive duck farm uh, in the first half of the century. And eventually when that duck farm declined, uh, temporarily it was the site of uh, a migrant uh, where, where migrant farm workers had been living um, on part of this park or the at the time it wasn't a park, but in this uh, area along the water. Uh, Suffolk County uh, took over that property in the early 60s with the intention of eventually making it um, a nature park and a, just a recreational facility. And eventually they would um, open uh, Indian Island Park. And part of that on uh, Peninsula was um, is now the Indian Island Golf Course. Um, and so Indian Island opens in 1972, and really at this time, that the second wave of golf course building is starting to um, slow down. There's been a rapid expansion of the golf scene on Long Island now over the past decade, starting from the early 60s now into the early 70s. So course building begins to lose um, a bit of steam. Um, one of the courses built in... Uh, 1967 is Spring Lake. It's in Middle Island. It's 27 holes. It's got um, an 18 hole course and a separate uh, nine hole course. And the owners of Spring Lake um, would uh, plan to build 36 holes in Manorville. And that's where um, Swan Lake was built and remains today. Swan Lake, like I said, was initially um, designed as a 36 hole facility uh, meant to sort of surpass the Spring Lakes 27 that they had built uh, in the previous decade. Um, unfortunately, they did not, were not able to build the second 18 because of um, some environmental concerns. But the main, the key figure behind both, the, both of these courses is a man named uh, Charlie Martin. He's considered one of the most uh, influential figures in local golf history, not necessarily for design, did design and restore courses around Long Island. He was more known for his construction uh, accomplishments. Um, 
it was estimated during the 60s boom period around the time Spring Lake was built. He'd also designed, uh, built Middle Island Country Club at this time. And it was estimated, according to one account, that he had personally had a, had a hand in 90% of the golf courses built in Westchester and Long Island at that time, whether it be for construction or his some design work or maybe remodeling a course that uh, had hired him to come and do some work there. Um, 90% of the golf course at that time is a tremendous amount of work. Um, he operated his own firm in Comac and prior to his uh, golf construction business, he had um, worked in turf maintenance at Yankee Stadium at Ebbets Field, um, Wingfoot uh, in Westchester, among other uh, famous facilities. Um, I believe his uh, granddaughter is on the call. I'm not sure if she's here, but I'm pretty sure she is. Um, she might want to chime in at the end. She does has given me uh, tons of articles and photos of uh, Swan Lake and some of and articles related to uh, her grandfather's accomplishments elsewhere. Um, she might want to chime in at the end and offer some contributions. Um, but this picture is uh, a recent picture of Swan Lake, um, which was built in 1979 as we're getting into a period, sort of a, a lull in between the second and what, what would be the, the third wave of uh, course building locally. So following this boom you, in the 80s and early 90s, again, we're in, we hit sort of a dead period. There's really not much being built um, locally as far as new golf courses are concerned. Obviously, there are economic issues at the time. Um, but as we hit um, the later half of the 90s, once again, there's a, a third course building boom, not only on Long Island, but nationally. There's a demand driven now by um, new financial and ge uh, social geography factors. There's more money available. There's a focus on combining golf <clears throat> and real estate. So you're seeing the, the growth of golf communities, um, you know, upscale housing where you can live on a golf course. You can sit on your pa patio right beside a fairway or a green and these uh, golf communities begin to uh, become popular nationally and also some on Long Island as well. And then, of course, there's um, the Tiger Woods effect. I started playing right before uh, Tiger Woods um, uh, took the world by storm. And, you know, I remember playing in the late 90s and having to wait hours just to play, just to finish a round on a, on a nine hole course. Uh, there were so many people. And there was this, you know, level of promise. Tiger Woods was inspiring so many people to play, and I'm sure he was inspiring plenty of businessmen and business uh, women to uh, forecast uh, years of growth in the golf course building industry. So, as you get into the late '90s and the turn of the century, um, there are golf courses popping up all across Long Island, especially on the East End, um, Cherry Creek and Riverhead. Uh, built its first course in 1996. It's a second course only a couple of years later. Um, this is uh, the Tallgrass Golf Course in Shoreham, which unfortunately uh, closed a couple of years ago, but this course was built in 2000. Um, Long Island National, right nearby in Riverhead, was built on a potato farm in 1999. Uh, Great Rock, uh, which uh, closed a couple of years ago as well was built in Wading River, that was in 2001. So there's this massive expansion again, this third wave of course building um, that's moving, you know, uh, with a, a focus on the East End, um, scenic properties, old farmland um, in Nassau County, there's a course built called Harbor Links that was built in a, basically in an old sand mine. Um, and in addition to the excitement about new courses, there's also the excitement about um, what's ahead uh, on a national level. Uh, Beth Page Black is being revamped at this time uh, to host uh, the 2002 US Open. It's being restored by Reese Jones. And on top of that, uh, Shinnecock Hills is gonna host another US Open coming up at this time in 2004. And here you have Tiger Woods teeing off at that 2002 US Open. 
and um, you have Retief Goosen uh, hitting an approach at the 2004 Open at Shinnecock. Um, meanwhile, on the private side, you have clubs being uh, new clubs being built on the East End as well. Uh, the Bridge in Bridgehampton uh, is built on an old racetrack. Um, Friars Head, although it was a little later, uh, more recently built about a decade ago. Um, that course in uh, Baiting Hollow uh, is considered one of the greatest, one of the great American golf courses. Uh, you know, even though it's brand new, it's already up there among the greats. Um, and there are others as well. Um, but that pretty much um, is your third and your final to date wave of course building on the island. Right now, we're probably between uh, uh, the third wave and a theoretical fourth. Um, there are not many courses being built uh, nationally, um, certainly not here on Long Island at the moment. Um, we've lost a couple of golf courses in the recent years. Um, I guess we're going to, if there's going to be a fourth wave, we're probably going to have to be create, get a little creative though, because uh, there's not a whole lot of land to develop uh, for golf courses right now. So we're going to have to see what the fourth wave, when it, when it arrives and what it has in store. Uh, but we do have a, um, a top golf which is uh, if anyone has been has driven on the Long Island Expressway recently and sees the big driving range uh, right there at exit 62, uh, that is the uh, first and only uh, New York Top Golf um, right now in existence. Uh, it's one of the new things in golf, combining uh, driving ranges and food and entertainment. So um, we do have that going for us right now, but. Um, Anyway, that is, uh, that's my uh, overview of uh, Long Island's golf development over 130 years. Um, there's plenty more uh, images and, and anecdotes and some more historical information uh, in my book. If you're interested, like Deanna said, there are some signed copies available at the museum. Um, you could also order direct from, from my site. I sign and personalize uh, if, if, uh, if desired. And you could also find that if you'd prefer to just uh, go into a local bookstore or even just buy even on Amazon, you'll find it uh, locally at a number of different Barnes and Nobles and independent bookstores uh, uh, and gift shops and things like that uh, around. So uh, I thank everyone for um, for uh, listening and I hope uh, you learned something about um, golf, uh, a course that you play or played in your youth. Uh, and um, like Deanna said, there will be, t if anyone has a question or, or a comment, um, you know, certainly um, send them our way. Okay. Uh, thank you, Phil. That was great. And uh, since I'm not a golfer myself, I'm impressed at how rich the history of the courses and the courses. Um, thank you for sharing, you know, so much your knowledge and enthusiasm. Um, we have a lot of comments and a lot of questions. So if you bear with me, I'm gonna to try to start from the top and work my way through um, some more comments. So you may, may not uh, wanna you know, comment back. Um, we have William who is a golf course superintendent out here on the East End. So he uh, shared his enthusiasm and we have some comments from him as well. Uh, David said in uh, my introduction to you, I mentioned that you didn't play Shelter Island's public course. And he said, oh, you haven't played the old goat course in Shelter Island, smart man. <laughs> uh, Terry asks, what is the last new course built on Long Island and uh, what year was it built? The last new course? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it sounds silly, but there's a pitch and putt in, um, Nickerson Beach out here uh, in Nassau County near uh, Lido. Um, uh, again, it sounds silly to promote or mention a pitch and putt, but it actually is a pretty legitimate little course. It was actually featured by um, uh, a, site, a, web, a golf design website called The Fried Egg. It was uh, featured a couple of years ago as sort of the, the way that modern golf should be presented going forward. It's uh, it's an interesting course, but it's a course that you could go to and take your kid and play for in, in 45 minutes uh, or an hour. And, and it, it, you know, it's worthwhile. It actually was built, I think, in 2015. Um, 
I'm pretty sure that's probably the last new course, unless I'm just drawing a blank. I might be. I'm not really sure, but I think that's that. That's probably the last one. Uh, we've lost a few since then, but I think that's the last course to actually be built. Well, as I scroll my way down, if someone has another one that they think was, you know, more recently, I'm sure they'll put it in the chat. Um, uh, William mentions Laurel Links opened in 2002, but but I think that might have been in response to the newer course. Well, uh, yeah, I have to actually have that noted, but um, okay. Yeah, Laurel Links is another of the uh, example of a new private club, um, very highly regarded. Uh, yeah. Yep, near on the North Fork. Um, uh, Terry was wondering what your thoughts were on the new Lido course. Are you familiar, I guess, in Lido Beach? The new Lido? Uh, that, I, it could be the one I just mentioned, or it could be um, in reference to the, which is not really new. I might, okay. I need that. Oh, wow. Oh. Yeah, uh, well, I didn't get into Lido because that has a whole history where we could do a whole lecture series just on Lido itself. Hmm. Uh, for those who might not be aware, um, the Lido golf course that exists today um, is not the original Lido. From uh, 1914 or so to World War II, uh, the designer I mentioned earlier, C.B. McDonald, is one of his crowning achievements was building the original Lido Club. And it's uh, almost like the Atlant it's called the Atlantis of golf because it was so great and then it was taken away. It was taken over by the Navy during the war and uh, basically destroyed. And so lately there's been this um, campaign to resurrect Lido in some capacity. So what they've done is um, they're in Wisconsin, I think it's Sand Hills in Wisconsin, um they're building an exact replica of the old Lido club you know down to the you know down to the finest details um and there's a whole backstory to that but i think it's going to be really cool obviously if you know for those who are able to go out take a golf trip out to uh wisconsin and, and see something like that it, uh, it would be really cool to see Okay, I, I'm trying to go from the beginning to back to the, what someone just posted because Dim responds to Lido, which is, Josh says, yep, going to be an awesome course. Lido tech they're using is unreal. And I don't even know what the tech is. Yeah, that, it's ref, in reference to the, the way that they're able to map uh, these courses using uh, like, uh, G, it's not my expertise, but just using, you know, geographical survey information and elevations and, and things like that. Okay. Um, Amy mentions you had the slide of the boys, um, the picture of the boys early on. Um, she said her grandfather was one of the boys. Oh yeah. Yeah. William said, um, and I think you probably, this might've pop popped up before you also said, Raynor also built West Hampton, Hyping Rock and Yale Golf Club. And then John says Raynor also built Southampton. Right. Uh, oh, this is this is a personal extension to you. Uh, William said he'd like to extend an invitation to you to join him for a round of golf at, at his club. Of course, once the weather is warmer, although uh, you mentioned there are some diehards that if it were in a blizzard outside, there might be some people yep. walking today. Yeah. Yep. Um, Terry says West Hampton is a highly underrated gem. The layout of Yale is fabulous. It's undergoing renovations, bringing it back to the original design. Right. Yeah, West Hampton, you know, I think uh, a lot of courses, especially out east, um, uh, you know, they're, they're normally they would be considered, you know, great golf courses. Uh, well, they are great golf courses, but they sort of get overshadowed by the Shinnecocks and Maidstones and all the other traditional clubs. Um, so they, you know, if they were located elsewhere in the country, they would be the premier club. Uh, some of them kind of get fall by the wayside a little bit. So West Hampton is probably considered one of those. Okay. Um, Jeff asked if we had any club members in this group, but I'm not sure which club he was referring to. So maybe if I later on, if, there, if he wants to clarify, um, Elliot says that my great grandfather, Stuart Hull Moore, 
co-founded the North Fork Country Club, opened in 1912, and used acreage owned by the family, plus land from another founder, hired Donald J. Ross, who you also referenced. Um, yeah, more, I think it was the more farmland or something like that, that was developed to, to build it. You said the name Moore, is that right? Or? Yes, M-O-O-R-E, yes. Right. And it said acreage owned by the family. So very likely that was farmland, yeah. Um, and then Daniel asked about Raiden, which he says there was supposed to be a course here on Bayview slash Great Hog Neck, which is the name of this area in South Hold, but the depression canceled the master plan. But as you spoke, it did actually, it was built and, and, and was used. Well, that, it could also reference an expansion of the club. Um, like I said, at 1932 profile that I showed, um, the one that compared a par at Raiden to beating Bobby Jones every day and Sunday. Yeah. I think in that profile, it mentioned that they had plans and the space to build an, ex uh, an expanded uh, course, and they never did. Mm -hmm. um, David said also, our family were members of the North Fork Country Club, which you referenced for four decades. I first played there as a child. Nice memory. Um, uh, this Wait, is can I just jump in for a second? Yeah, please. I, think I recognize the name, and I meant to thank in the beginning, I, if any, which I think at least one of them is. I do want to thank the uh, people at the South Hold Library uh, for helping me when I was researching for the book. They provided uh, photos and uh, articles and letters. Um, yeah, I think uh, Daniel was one of them who uh, mm. gave me a lot of that information. So I do want to uh, I do want to thank uh, them as well. Great. Um, now, with regard to Ross and North for a Country Club, I think this comment. Um, from William, he says, but didn't the architects back then adhere to strict ethics and therefore Ross would not have encroached into the other, into area of the other established architects on Long Island? Because you said he only had designed the one, correct? Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that was, I, I do remember reading about sort of a gentleman's agreement between friends, between uh, uh, Ross and Deborah Emmett. I'm sure there were others. I, you know, I don't know the the, the personal relationships. I'm sure there are experts on those designers individually who would know mm -hmm. more about that than me. But, uh, you know, I do know that the relationship between Ross and I believe Emmett. So, you know, he uh, uh, certainly possible that he wouldn't have wanted to step on toes, so to speak. And there's actually debate whether, I think it's almost accepted that Ross never even actually came to Long Island to make that design. He might have just... Uh, from afar and had his plans then put in motion by whoever built the course. Oh, that, that's interesting because the, the, the question after next, I think, relates to that as well. Uh, but before that, George asked a really interesting question that I'm not sure uh, you can answer specifically, but he does ask which courses were anti-Semitic and which were racially biased. And is this true today? I guess are those biases still there? Well, first of all, I don't, um, I've never been um, really involved in club, the club side of golf. Uh, so I don't really know. I don't really know or pay much attention to, to that. I mean, I, for the most part, I go out and I play, you know, I play golf on a public course and I come home and I don't really get involved in, um, you know, in that. I, I know that if you, when you go through the history and you, you, you know, there, I, I know that there were clubs that, were known to be anti-Semitic or anti this or that. But to be honest, that's not a side of it that I really am all that knowledgeable about at all. So I couldn't really get into it. Well, thank you for the direct answer. Um, now, Justin asked about North Fork Country Club and Donald Ross, and, and you said maybe he had helped or designed it from afar. So he did ask, how involved was he in the design did he design and build this before or after Pinehurst? Do you know? And also, he's curious if the tiny nine hole cedars here on the North Fork in Kutchog was associated with North Fork Country Club. Um, I, I'm not sure that there was a real association. I do know that um, when I 
uh, was at the Kutchog Library, and they provided me uh, with some information. A lot of it was autobiographical information uh, from the families or families that were involved <clears throat> in building um, or developing uh, cedars. And I know that some of them worked on the construction of North Fork when they were young. Uh, I remember reading from that autobiography that um, a lot of them caddied at North Fork. Um, event, uh, Cedars itself had been sort of one of those rudimentary courses early, um, early on in the you know 1910s and 20s, I, I believe, and then eventually that that land would become uh, part of Cedars uh, down the road. But I, I'm not sure there was any real actual association between the two. I could be wrong though. I mean, I'm not uh, really an expert on the very fine local history, but. Uh, from what I know, I don't, I don't think there was an association. Okay, yeah, I see that late a little bit further down, Ellie, Elliot says there was, there is no connection um, between North Fork Country Club and Cedars. But also Justin mentioned that the neighborhood across from the Riverhead Clubhouse, which you said is now the Elks Club, um, is still known as the Greens. So right. interesting, like the names of the streets, mm -hmm. uh, the Greens. Um, Okay, then there's the conversation about the Radian Golf Club and that the clubhouse still stands. Uh, someone had asked, they thought that that was the General Wayne Inn, which was a historic structure down in that same area. However, that was a different house um, and, the, and the golf club does stand. In fact, I drove past it yesterday because I was thinking of taking a picture um, and it was too busy on Main Bayview, the road that it's on because uh, with the snow coming, everyone was out. Uh -huh. And uh, it does still stand. It does look a little different. There is a um, handicap ramp along the front, an ADA ramp in the front, and the porch looks different. Um, but it is recognizable. Okay. Uh, pictured. Okay. Who did you? This came up I, when you had the picture of Islands End up. Everyone was excited. They recognized Islands End with the sound there. And I and I apologize because I was managing the chat and also listening. Uh, someone asked who designed Islands End. Did you answer that already, Phil? Uh, well, I know that um, Mar Charles Martin, who I mentioned uh, and featured there in the chat, um, he was involved. Uh, whether he designed it or not, I'm not totally certain. Uh, I feel like there's a different name involved with Islands End. He he might have been the construction uh, person. I know his. I believe his granddaughter is in the chat and, and wants to contribute. Um, yes. She might be able to shed some light on that. Um, uh, yeah, the case. Sorry, I'm looking at the comments too as well. Oh, so so, so many great comments. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the case family. That's the autobiographical information I referenced from the case family. Okay. Uh, as far as Islands End. Uh, I'm not positive. Someone mentioned Herbert Strong. It's not Herbert Strong. I can tell you that. Okay. There's also a mention because um, I believe it was Islands End that you had mentioned was built on an old a former labor camp uh, for migrant uh, workers. In, and Indian, Island. Indian Island. Indian Island. I'm sorry. Yeah, different place. Um, one's in Riverhead. One's out in East Marion. Uh, David says that there was an old labor camp in Greenport, but I'm not sure if this is related to a course. Um, had one also on the North Road where the nursing home stands now. And there were a number of them on the North Fork actually, including Cox Lane and Kutchog, et cetera. Right. Um, okay, let's see. Tall Grass, I believe that was Shirley, was a, a Gill Hans gem and a shame that it, has, it was closed to become a solar farm, says William. I agree. It was one. It was my favorite, and uh, it is now destroyed. It's covered in solar panels. It's too bad. Much to um, the chagrin of most people who played there, it was very popular. Mm -hmm. uh, Justin also asked if you had any idea when the former Calverton Links course was open. Uh, again, one of my personal uh, favorites. Uh, I think I mentioned, I might have mentioned, although I had it written, I don't know if I mentioned it, but um, Calverton um, was originally nine. I don't remember exactly when it was built. I think it was early 90s, and then it was expanded to 18 in 1999. And it closed, I believe, uh, in 2013. It was kind of a surprise. The uh, owners uh, were not interested in running it anymore. And uh, I think I'm pretty sure it was 2013 when it closed. And it still sits there 
you could see the remains of it. It's actually been used now as a, uh, for I think uh, like paintball and disc golf, mm -hmm. a lot of like outdoor adventure park type things. Okay, so I haven't been there, but that does sound like it's just adjacent to the Grumman property as well over in that area. Calverton Links or uh, yes, Swan Calverton Link, I think. Links? Calverton Links. Uh, I think, I, well, I think Swan Lake is the one that's literally right next door. Okay. To okay. Um, actually, uh, William confirmed about Calvert Tones the early 90s, but he's not sure exactly either. Uh, he mentions that Laurel Links was built and opened the same time as Friars had, uh, which he talked about. Uh, interesting tidbit here Daniel says that there was a driving range in Greenport near Drossos and the drive in which is where, near where St. Peter's Lutheran Church is as well. Um, uh, so we have a lot of thanks for the information and the wonderful presentation. And um, Tracy would love to add a few words. Um, you had, had mentioned her and I also have a hand raised too. So um, I'm gonna try to unmute Tracy and then uh, check out who else was, was interested in maybe can, speaking to you directly. Mm -hmm. Okay, just bear with me here. Um, participants. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Okay, I have to turn. I have to turn my sound off. Um, so I'm Tracy Feldman. My grandfather was Charlie Martin, who designed and built all the choruses. Where our family is very happy to be um, three generations in the golf course business. Um, so I'm going to add a little bit about the fourth wave or the next wave of golf. Um, because I've been at the PGA show and the National Golf Course Owners Association all week. It's gonna be kind of digital, virtual, um, according to all the inventors and tech guys that I met this week. They spent the last two years of COVID when they were not really able to do other things, uh, working on all of, all of these virtual games to connect people via golf courses. So it's it's a little bit interesting to see where the, where they're taking it, um, and the plan is to make things a lot um, more automated and self serve, which probably regular golfers are not going to be uh, so happy about that. But it appeals to the young audience. <laughs> um, and just listening to Phil, a great job, and it's kind of crazy how twice you mentioned. The turn of the century in regards to long island golf yeah yeah i think i actually wrote in the in the book uh at each turn of the century there was excitement um uh they had just hosted a u.s open on long island at shinnecock hills ironically in 1896 and then in 1995 so in both cases both turns of the century there was uh, momentum from a u.s open at Shinnecock Hills, uh, with just you know, with designs on continuing development uh, going forward. Yeah, my grandfather even worked on Shinnecock Hills in his long career. Yeah, it's certainly. I haven't even gotten through all the articles that you sent because I keep getting <laughs> sidetracked with uh, going down different rabbit holes. I just have gone into a research on a, another course that I had not never had gotten into previously. Uh, a pitch and putt course in uh, Lido Beach, which I uh, actually have, my phone has been ringing with uh, people chiming in on a Facebook post I put up with inf for information. You know, it, I was talking to Deanna yesterday, I guess someone had asked about how many courses had closed on Long Island was that you had received from somebody. Yes. And I, I don't know the answer because it, every time I sit down and start going through old news accounts, I pull up another reference to another course that I'd not seen previously. So maybe one day I'll, I'll figure it out, but not, not just yet. Okay. Well, so there are some more questions it, it is, it has gone long, but if you don't mind, I'll pick a few more out. Um, 
if since it's still snowing out and and hopefully we're waiting for it to pass before we can can shovel uh, donna asks if there's any info on the women's national golf and tennis club that is now glenhead yeah well that was um that was a, a Devereux emmett course um he was involved with uh marion hollands who was a prominent uh, women's uh, player uh, uh, female amateur at the time um and they developed that course uh and it, it was a course that i guess in a, in a sense was uh, was innovative it was tailored to to women um you know it was laid out in a way that would be more favorable for women to play they you know it was seen as i guess unfair at the time that you know why should a woman go on a course and have to play according to the strengths of, of the male players. So that was a course that was built uh, uh, with Hollins and with Devereux Emmett and uh, eventually that did become uh, the Glenhead Club. Okay. Um, there's a question, Sean asks, any word or hope of Island Hills in Sayville going back to a golf course? Uh, I don't know it intimately, but I would say there's zero hope. <laughs> Okay. From what I know, it's supposed to be earmarked for a resident. You know, it's the typical Long Island story of a developer wanting to build something and the community saying, we don't want that. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that it's not going to be a golf course again. Mm. Joseph asks if there's any idea of the rating club layout uh, that one here, Don and Bayview, ever, did we ever, did you ever see a card? I know you and I have had a little conversation about this, but maybe you want to. Uh, uh, I don't know of any, um, you know, a scorecard or a, a, a sketch of, a, of the course. That's the kind of stuff I really like to get my hands on, uh, mm. not just for Raiden, but for any of these old courses, uh, especially when I showed in the beginning of the slideshow, the Massapequa Hotel. I, I'm right five minutes away from that area, and I've tried to get some information from locals who might have had a firsthand perspective on that course or maybe some artifacts from it, a scorecard or something. Um, but uh, I haven't been able to do that just yet. And uh, time is running out to get any firsthand accounts because mm -hmm. the course has been closed for uh, almost 70 years now. So right. <clears throat> so I haven't seen anything like that on Raiden just yet, but hopefully uh, soon. Yeah. Uh, uh, so Daniel also mentioned that they built out the cottages here on Raiden Shore. So while the club is maybe in the baby section more on the west side, on the east side, there are there were cottages right in Shores community, um, actually, which is going to be part of our summer exhibit here at South Fault Historical Museum. So if you're, you know, have an interest in that area, you might want to come over the summer. Uh, but yeah, but you referenced that there had been a larger plan for the whole community, which did not take off. And also Raiden, interestingly, you know, so many of the, the places we think of associated with names, people's names, but actually Raiden um, was named after the community from England as Southhold is uh, named after Southwald in England. So was Raiden, a neighboring community in Southwold and here in Southwold as well. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting question, not necessarily a history question, but uh, Terry wonders which public course on Long Island has the best practice facilities? Um, I, actually, I get that question a fair amount. It, um, I know, um, let's see, I know people always talk about in Manorville, yeah, a, a good practice. Um, I, Wind Watch in um, Oppog has, uh, I believe, a grass driving range and like a practice bunker. Um, uh, actually, Eisenhower Park recently I opened a small, uh, what do you call it, uh, a short game uh, practice area in addition to their range that they have there. So that's pretty good. Um, a lot of people like grass driving ranges. Unfortunately, I, I don't think Long Island really has the uh, climate like uh, the Carolinas and Florida where you typically find a grass driving range. Uh, so you don't see them often here, but um, you know, Pine Hills, Wind Watch, Mill Pond has a, has a big, nice big driving range. So that's good too. Okay, there are a few more comments, um, all of which I can share the whole chat with you directly, Phil. So if there are any other comments that people made, um, you can be sure that Phil will get them. 
Um, I think we've, we've pushed our luck with the wind and reception and internet. So I, I think perhaps we'll wrap it up here. Uh, thank you for, for not only like sharing so much of you, yourself, but letting us pick your brain because certainly we've, we've thrown a lot of questions at you as well and you've been terrific to answer them all. Um, on behalf of the Board of Trustees of Southwold Historical Museum, I thank everyone for joining us today uh, in the middle of this blizzard. And we hope that you all stay safe and stay warm. Um, and again, thank you, Phil. Again, thank you for having me and, and inviting me to talk about this. And, and I appreciate everyone uh, logging on and, and joining and uh, listening to me talk about this stuff for a little while. Okay, thank you and stay well. All right, thanks a lot.